several people have asked me if I could take them on a behind the scenes of the frustration masterclass just to kind of show you what's in there. So if you've got 15 minutes, if you've been interested in taking the masterclass, then you are very welcome. So I've aimed it at dog trainers, behavior consultants, um, vet assistants take it, even vets take it, but also people who work with animals every day. So people in shelters are very welcome to take it. Just basically anybody who's interested in dogs to the degree that you want to know a little bit more about frustration. So what do you get? So we've got 60 hours. I really never intended it to be so big, but there were so many things that I wanted to talk about. You'll also find as well, along with the materials, that there are things in the dedicated Facebook space. So that includes uh, regular little webinars and case studies and questions that come up. So we have discussions in there. Mostly they're just fairly straightforward things, but if I've got a case study that's really interesting or I think I want to discuss aspects of frustration that are in there, you'll find those in there. So for the next round, I'm also doing one per week and they cover a range of different case studies. We're also looking at the most up-to-date research. It's not very much. People are not researching frustration because it's not like the big books research. So everybody's researching fear and anxiety, but less so with frustration. So those kind of things happen in Facebook. They're always there for you to access and everything that you get here is lifetime access. So if you sign up to the course, then you get everything from this year, but you are a member forever. It's lifetime until you choose to leave, or if you choose to leave. And that means that you get the webinars with people um, as they come up at each time that I'm going to be running through it. And you'll also get all of the up-to-date case studies as we're going through, because I deal with about maybe 100, 150 case studies a year. And lots of those have got frustration in there. Some of them are pretty similar, but sometimes there's some of the weirder, more unusual ones that come up that I like to just kind of run through with you. And you're also welcome to upload things into the group so that you can discuss them in there and you can share videos and talk things over with colleagues. So I wanted to just create a real nice safe space for that. So that said, I'm going to show you what's on the course because you don't want to just know what's in the Facebook group. So I've divided the course up into six areas and we just start with a general overview. So in the general overview, we just talk about uh, what frustration is from an ethological perspective and a neurobiological perspective. So those things cross over, of course. So the kind of things in here are just, this is what I would basically want just if I had to know the basics and I just wanted something that's just gives me like an overview. So we talk about what it is from a research perspective and from a definition perspective. So we're all talking about the same thing right from the very beginning. And we're also talking about what it does and, and why some of our dogs, particularly the ones that we've bred for specific tendencies, might have those things more than any other dog. Um, so we talk about that and we also talk about the body language. So there's growing research, but I have to say the research is always very narrow because it's very much focused on the things that people have been able to show in research. So that doesn't include things where they didn't find very clear results or where there were specific things that were different. So here we're just looking at a whole load of different videos. We're looking at the kind of things that dogs do uh, that show differences between breeds. So if you know me and we've talked about frustration before, you'll know about the Spaniel Chuff, uh, the Mali Chatter and the Greyhound Chatter and things like that that are things that we might expect to see all of the time when we're looking at frustration in different breed groups. We also talk about the neurobiology. Again, there's not very much research. And the shame of it is that where we have got research that people have talked about in dog terms, they're often taking what is very, very human research and not actually talking about animal models. So we needed to make sure that we were really careful when we're talking about neurobiology of frustration, because when we're talking about that, we need not to include the studies where it's about 17 adolescent males uh, who are doing research on frustration in a lab. So we need to be really careful about what we can generalize, especially when it's looking very much at the human side of things. We talk about the development as well, but that in itself is a huge module. So we'll talk about that later. And we talk about emotion regulation. If you know me, then you know I talk quite a lot about emotion regulation, about why it's important that we can tolerate degrees of frustration because we can't live a frustration-free life and about how we do that and that crosses into some of the ethics of training and support and this was my really big thing about frustration because nobody bothered to tell me it was kind of a thing that we all we all know really what it looks like i guess but 
what I started to see, it was quite often that I was having to deal with that first before I could make any progress in other areas, even if the dog was anxious. So say, for instance, I'm just working with a reactive dog, just in general, just a really straightforward case. Dog's a little bit dog reactive. It can be elements of frustration in there. It can be elements of anxiety. But why it's important to deal with the frustration first is because if you don't deal with the frustration, then the situation is really frustrating and you can't actually get to tackle the underlying anxiety. So unless the dog is able to regulate their emotions, then trying to do things with frustration or impulsivity is going to be really challenging. And when I set out to do Lighten Up, it was very much about reactivity and it still is of course it still is but my major number one rule as were always frustration and impulsivity because if we've got any elements of those trying to do any work around um, dog to dog reactivity or human directed reactivity you're really going to struggle if the dog hasn't got any ability whatsoever to tolerate degrees of frustration so if they want to say for instance jump up on a person in order to kind of um i often call it the trial by ordeal greeting if they feel like i'm i'm quite anxious and i'm just going to kind of diffuse the situation jump up all over the person because i'm anxious um you're going to find some frustration there so for me very it's very important that we do take frustration and impulsivity seriously because unless we don't if we don't then we're going to find everything else is just really really slow and of course our clients come to us with their frustrations and it's very easy if we don't deal with the dog's frustration and the human's frustration that we're going to see people disengage and, and uh, go somewhere else because disengagement is a huge big factor in frustration. So after we looked at those things, then we go on and we talk about the impact of frustration in dogs' lives. So this is very much my um, comfort zone as a behaviour consultant. So we look at all kinds of different things like the heritability of frustration and we link it in there with stress responses and of course impulsivity as well. And we look at frustration in training a little bit, but that in itself then expands in module three to become a huge module. After that, we're looking at canine relationships. I deal with a lot of multi-dog aggression cases. So out of the 100 cases, 150 cases that I deal with across a year, say about 60% of those will be about aggression um, in the house where dogs have been fighting and uh, sometimes injured another dog, sometimes even worse than that. So we talk quite a lot about canine relationships, but also human relationships as well. Certainly things like resource guarding are going to fit in there. One thing that I didn't really consider very much, and it's mostly because I don't deal with separation anxiety cases very much, but is the big research from 2020 on just how much frustration is a part of separation anxiety. Well, uh, separation related behaviors. Now, I know some people who work exclusively with separation related behaviors see frustration as almost like, hmm, it's not very important. Well, it is if I've known, there was one year where I knew seven dogs who'd hanged themselves and a lot of that separation related behavior is related to frustration. So it can be hugely dangerous. I also know dogs who really struggle and then start self-mutilating. So I've had to have tails amputated uh, and had to have extensive surgery and lends itself to things like acrylic granulotis and things like this. So it was really important that I dealt with the frustration. And again, it's an easy rule out. It's easy-ish to treat. And when we've got elements of that with separation related behavior, I think it's really important and I don't want to dismiss it and say that it's not severe or it's not serious because it can fuel a lot of behavior that then goes on to become serious. So I know we joke about dogs who destroy settees and couches, things like that, but it's not very likely unless you work in a veterinary setting that you know dogs who've had... Um, who've ingested neurotoxic poison, for example, because they've destroyed a, a couch and ingested some of it. So it does lead itself to behaviours that dogs do on their own that can cause the dog to suffer physi physiologically um, and to suffer with their health and even to lose their lives as a result. So I don't brush off frustration and separation related behaviour and think of it somehow as lesser than fear. I wouldn't, would I? Because I wouldn't have written this course if I felt like that. 
But I do think that frustration can fuel some destructive behaviour, some very big behaviour, that it was kind of important for us to discuss. So that one's pretty long. Aggression is my, my sweet spot when I'm talking about canine behaviour, basically because I find it so straightforward to deal with, like don't do that. <laughs> that makes it easy. So we talk about aggression and reactivity, they're my big things. And then we spend a huge bit block in this talking about issues to do with intrinsic motivation. We don't talk very much about that in the dog training world. Maybe that's the behavior science focus on things. So we talk quite a lot there about um, Kent Berridge and his work and wanting versus liking. We talk about different uh, ways of looking at predation and how frustrating that can be. And anybody who's had a spaniel trapped behind a glass window whilst there's birds outside will have sensed that frustration. But again, it can lead to some... Uh, behaviours, uh, noisy, loud behaviours, sometimes very destructive behaviours um, that can result in difficulties for guardians. And certainly I can't, there, there are things that I look at in how we work with predation that I don't think you can do if you've got a frustrated or an impulsive dog. I'm living with a dog who was frustrated and frustrations like she had, Liddy has 99 problems and frustration is not one of them. So it's a very workable problem. But at the same time, impulsivity, she needs me to step up. But living with a dog who has struggled with frustration in the past and still does, we must work, walk past seven or eight cats every single morning. And that causes an enormous amount of frustration for her. And that's got some kind of spillover, um, particularly because she's impulsive as well. So when I'm seeing those behaviours, sometimes I think it's interesting to look at it through another lens rather than just going back down the old um kind of ones that are more familiar to us so we talk about that and then i introduce you to um some documents about assessing frustration in dogs and we talk about those and there's also some guidance in the facebook group too after that then we move on to the one that i love and it is a bit technical and more for people i think who are coming to this from agility or sports or precision training or obedience or any of those things and we just get down into the minutiae of learning theory. So we talk about um, the interplay and I think this is also really important that when we start working with rewards based methods what we're using are things that are of value to a dog that can then be immensely frustrating when they don't get immediate access to them. And I don't think this is something that we're always aware of, that we can be generating more frustration than we're actually resolving. So when we start using things like positive reinforcement, it's really important to understand where frustration comes from and how we can resolve it before we even start. And knowing, and good trainers do this instinctively, you know, I look at their packages and their programs and you can see that they've built in ways to make sure that the criteria aren't too challenging, that trainers aren't being too greedy in what they're asking for, that we're not being too stingy and too mean with our rewards. But these are things that can cause quite a lot of aggression sometimes. And it can feel a bit weird the first time that a dog bites you because you're in control of the resources and that they don't, um, they have opinions about that. So I think it's something that is really important, even if we're just doing something really simple like teaching a dog to sit, there can be a huge amount of frustration that's generated in that process, even if we're using the kindest, most gentle methods, if we don't understand that manipulating resources and manipulating things that the dog finds valuable it can sometimes cause frustration. And that's not to say that we can't or shouldn't train dogs. I don't believe that at all. I see some of the biggest and most frustrated dogs that I see are ones who've had no structure and no support whatsoever from the humans. And I think that's really important too, that you know my feelings about this. So we also look at, I don't use timeouts, but we look at timeouts and uh, we look at all the things I don't use because I know how frustrating they can be. Um, we look at delay behaviours, so these are behaviours where dogs are struggling to wait, but not just that, but we're also looking at duration behaviours. So for instance, I hear so much about dogs who are um, working or doing sports that they really struggle with the wait before and they also struggle with things that take them a long time. Uh, so it may be something, for instance, like a weight behaviour or walking to heel behaviour can be very frustrating for a dog where we're asking for repetition and duration behaviours. 
We also talk about some things that are not discussed very often, which is the downshifting, because of course we don't want that. What's that, the first question that my clients always ask me when I can't phase out the, re the rewards? We're so mean, aren't we, as a species? But downshifting can be really, I get cross if my, you would get cross. I mean, we're in a cost of living crisis. We get cross when our, our pay is worth less than it was a year ago. So downshifting can be a source of frustration. And when we're starting to manipulate the schedules of reinforcement that we use with a the dog, then we need to understand the potential cost of those. And I think naturally good trainers or good trainers who are really well trained know about these things instinctively. And it's about sometimes I don't work with, most of the time I'm working with people who are not experts in canine behavior and don't understand that, you know, if you, you start swapping out, you start swapping to a ratio of one in 10, then your dog might have opinions about that. So I work also a lot with differential reinforcement, replacement behaviors, and operant extinction usually comes along as part of that, that we're, we're getting rid of one behavior and we're increasing another. So I think where we're using differential reinforcement procedures like you know we're training a dog to have four feet on the floor or to do another behavior a leg lean for instance or a shoulder target instead of jumping up on us then we think that's just fine and dandy but we're also extinguishing jumping up which is frustrating for the guardian and also frustrating for the dog when we're ex we're not paying out for that anymore so we talk about extinction uh, which is the mother of frustration um, even you know, we might as well call operant extinction just frustration by another name in some ways. We talk too about things like schedules of reinforcement. It does get techie. I like the techie. I am not offended by techie. And um, we talk about motivation operations. Why I struggle is because sometimes it's so techie it makes my head hurt. And so I like to kind of mitigate that and say, okay, well, this is how that looks in real life. This is where we do it in real life. Here's a video of that happening in real life. So it's very much about the practicalities of that. And so I start with a baseline of you, you're smart people. Everybody who takes my courses is educated and they know what they're doing and they know what they're talking about. And they may have forgot a lot of things because you've been doing it for 10, 20 years. But talking about some of these things does help uh, me in clarifying what we're talking about and making sure that, you know, this is our focus for today. So, and even if you've never heard that term before, um, I shouldn't be ashamed to say some of these are things that I never even really thought about until I was working with dogs for four or five years. So these are a lot of things that I would talk about there um, in terms of that. And my favourites at the end, and it's just, it's just because I, I, must experience this termination of enjoyable activities like what do you do when the good stuff stops after that we move on to a client module and it's a good point at this point to say this is not a you must do this 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 and this in this order i've put it in a logical order for me and i do it is drip fed so and the reason it's drip fed so you get a module every two weeks is because otherwise you're just going to be like oh my god it's just a, a huge wave of materials and it's too much and also i do kind of want to encourage you very gently to go through each of the areas because they're all important so that's a reason why i did it in that way but once the course is full access after tw the 12 week period, you've got everything and you can dip into what you want and when you want it and, and, and so on. So the module on client frustrations is very much for people who work with clients, um, human clients on a daily basis, <laughs> because I love that line from Mel Robbins where she says, we need to be frustrated in order to make a change. We need to be so frustrated with the way that things are that we say no more. And that's what our clients, that's the feeling that our clients often have the moment that they pick up the telephone and they're looking online for our number or contact forms or so on, that they come with enormous frustrations that we have to navigate. And there's, there's four types of fallout for frustration. One is that it can end in very destructive behavior and redirected aggression, which is exactly the same with human beings that, you know, when I hear um, people whose dogs are going nuts and the dogs are really frustrated because they can't get to a dog on the other side of the fence. And then the next thing I hear is the guardian say, shut up and, you know, and so on. So I see a lot of those tensions then impact on the dog, which is my major concern. 
so I talk about that and I also talk about and this is a big thing for me is the need for speed and I do think it's important that we can offer clients solutions to some of their problems the big problems fairly quickly because otherwise we get another problem with frustration which is complete disengagement and trying something else so if you've ever seen a husky trying to get out of a kennel then you will know exactly what i'm talking about because this is our clients that they like okay that didn't work i'm going to try something else so we get a lot of trialing of things and this is where sometimes i think we're losing clients because we aren't necessarily understanding the problem and this is my experience you know i don't think I came to it with a really clear eye for frustration and impulsivity at the beginning and the things I was doing naturally kind of tied into that but because I didn't it always hit the things straight away at the beginning of my career I was losing people because they were looking for quicker solutions and then they were coming back to me on the bounce six months later well okay I've tried all of these things and they didn't work um, and a lot of those were aversive tools so some of that is about coping with client frustrations, coaching a frustrated client. Now, I don't know if you know very much about my background, but I've been a teacher, I've been an educator, I've also been a process consultant. And that sounds like a terrible name, doesn't it? A random made up 21st century thing. What that means is that I would go into organizations and work with teams, sometimes the entire organization, sometimes individuals on a change agenda. And that's exactly what we're doing with our clients. And not everybody is invested in that change agenda. So I work very much from a helping perspective of helping people understand what's happening and the changes that are going to be taking place and understanding resistance as well. So that's what my postgrad qualifications are actually in, is moving people through change, which is exactly what we're doing with our, our dogs. So it's something that I feel very passionate about. It's something that I feel is very important. And I also think we're not there yet as an industry in terms of we talk very often about using fluffy methods with dogs and then we talk about compliance with human beings. And worse still, that some of the stuff that kind of comes out um, encouraging us to be more cooperative and more uh, take a more coaching model with clients still uses words like compliance. And I, there's a mismatch and I think it's important that we get it right because it's really important because our clients come in with this point of frustration. So there is stuff in there. But if you don't work with clients, you're not working with people because you have the lucky position of being in a shelter and having to do none of the front of house stuff in the shelter or none of the, you know, people dropping their dogs off in shelter. I think that's probably the only situation, isn't it, where you're not having to deal with people. Um, then you could probably, I guess, skip those bits if they weren't for you. And for there, I've put in a little bit of sweetener as well that you've got some case studies that will help you. Um, so there are three case studies in that one. Of course, there are going to be more in the Facebook group because that's going to be the focus for 2023 is to get some more of those in there. I've had some humdingers of frustration cases in the last like six months since the course finished for its first uh, first iteration. Um, just like hormones, medical things going on, things that you wouldn't have expected, uh, all kinds of great. And uh, people come into me with a list of 97 behind. No, not 97. I did have one. I've got one case study where she put nine. We had 19 things that she wanted to work on with the dog um, and all of them were frustration related and within three weeks because we were very much focused on the frustration agenda a lot of those problems had dissipated great after that we spend a full module uh, looking at the development of frustration if it's very much within stress coping skills so we're looking at things that would help dogs in general be more resilient and to be um, more robust as puppy individuals um, so we're talking here about all of the factors that can contribute to frustration in, in in its different forms so there's that weird one about object permanence you're probably thinking what's that doing there in the frustration course well once you understand that you the thing that you want isn't here but it's on the other side of something that helps us understand why some dogs are very frustrated about the things that they can't get to that they know still exist so object permanence is something that probably sounds a little bit freaky to be in there but i've put in there because it relates in human children you have a triad of object permanent separation 
um, anxiety and stranger danger that emerge at the same time. And guess what? We get the same with our puppies. Um, so that's in there. And we talk about some of the methods that we use with puppies. I do think we use timeouts probably more frequently than we might if we look at things with a sensitised eye to frustration and particularly puppy biting and timeouts, as you can see there. And I've also stuck a bit in there about supporting the high drive or the, the intrinsically motivated puppy because their lives are filled with frustration. And then we've got a module on adolescence as well and how to help our puppies cope with um, transitioning when the good stuff stops and how to help them bridge that gap. So there's all of that that's in there. And then the final module, this is kind of like, you're motivated to get, this is the goal at the end, isn't it? Everybody just wants the cheat sheet, the answers. And you can see hopefully why I've structured it in the way that I have, because you can't, I, I wanted that at the beginning of my career is you want the answers, you want the solutions, you want the little games and the things that will work with the dogs that you're working with. But unless you understand specifically what the problem is, you need to, one, you're gonna get frustrated dogs and two, you're gonna get frustrated clients. So I look at some topics that are big topics within the, um, within our work, just generally, whether we're working in training or whether we're working in behavior consultancy, so for instance, big one for me is loose leash. And I think there's quite a lot of frustration that we cause when we're using reward-based methods and there are maybe other ways that we can do it. We also talk about object play manners. Now I work a lot with rescue dogs and adult dogs that have been rehomed, particularly from kind of like somebody's yard in France and there's been a working dog, uh, you know, so working gun dogs, working hounds, um, dogs who've been just kept as a, a basically keep away potential burglars, you know, good guardian dogs. And some of them have not had the benefit of socialization to teach them bite inhibition necessarily. And so sometimes they don't play well with toys. And sometimes they don't know what toys are. Uh, some kind of some of the hounds that I've worked with who just didn't know what a toy was. And so this is also for dogs who, who are adult hard mouthed dogs to help us do things in a less frustrating way. Because if we want to be using treats and toys with dogs and you can't do that when you're working with a dog who's got really, really, really hard mouth and leaves bruises or, you know, does a lot of damage to you um, when they're trying to get a, hand, a handful of treats from you. And I have seen dogs push people up against walls and mug them, um, adult dogs. And if you're working with a, you know, a 40, 45 kilo dog who decides that, hey, I'm interested in what's in your treat pouch, then that can be a source of real frustration for us. So we also talk quite a lot in this unit. It's something I picked up in France and also uh, further in Italy. The, one of the people who is on the first iteration of the course said, this is exactly what's happening in Italy. And then I had to like, brush up on my Italian and go and do a bit of learning. And it absolutely is. And I think sometimes the problem with Italian and English and, and French speakers, they don't feel comfortable speaking English. So they're not giving these as gifts to the rest of the world. But the Think Dog program um, in Italy and the way a lot of behaviour consultants work in France is with restorative socialisation, which can be a real benefit. But if you've got elements of frustration in there first, then that, the dogs are really going to struggle with that. And what's really interesting is a lot of the dogs coming back to the UK live in single dog households and don't necessarily have the benefit of having had good socialization in the first place you know they don't necessarily have um the refinement of canine codes that i see with some of the very social french dogs that i work with who who who, who are masters of communication and so i think this is a really important topic and i see a lot of the ways that this is done in the US in particular and in the UK is e painful. <laughs> so watching it from a French perspective and from the Italian perspective, I'm kind of like, this is a bit ouch. And also causing a lot of frustration, taking a lot of risk with the dogs, adding barriers in there that can sometimes cause frustration that we're not necessarily understanding. And so I'm basically just in the restorative socialization session, 144 minutes of me, uh, which is obscene. No, there's lots of video in there um, talking about the benefits of that and how to run good restorative socialization sessions that minimize frustration for the dogs. 
And we also talk about things related to um, street and village dog rescues who can have a lot of learned helplessness, which comes, again, from frustration that if all of your attempts to meet your goals are thwarted, then you just learn to give up. And I think some of the rescue dogs that we see coming into the UK, sometimes in France, where they've been taken from the streets where they had relative autonomy, um, relative because there's never complete autonomy as we know, then that can be very frustrating to find themselves in a world of gates and leads and doors and restrictions, especially with people that they don't even really know. And then we talk about the last one, uh, which relates, uh, this is my Spaniel module, uh, relates to control, consent, self and choice. Because we all know Spaniels are dogs with opinions, aren't they, about who touches them. And uh, probably 80% of my Spaniel clients come with that exact problem. Uh, that just don't see with the Shepherd's clients that I get. Um, and so we talk about uh, cooperative care and things like that in that module. So that's basically everything that you get in the Frustration Masterclass. I'm just going to show you kind of like how that almost looks. Um, so, so if I just take some sort of general unit, so of course you get me talking on video about stuff. There I am, uh, looking marvellous in my pink scarf with a Christmas tree. Um, so I kind of do notes, very short notes, just to give you the headline figures. And what I'm going to do this time as well is I'm just going to do a set of flashcards, cheat sheet, if you like, for what happens in each module with a big learning from each, because I think that's important. So the written notes are usually shorter. Sometimes there's additional videos. Uh, I think this was one where Liddy's kind of cutting in and we're talking about frustration related to dogs who, when another dog, so it's motivating operations and all the complicated, uh, fun, techie stuff, um, dogs that when another dog gets something and they see that other dog getting something suddenly realise, hey, I would like that too. And it wasn't an issue before, but it is now. So we talk about that. I see a lot of that with shepherds is the kind of um, using their bodies to make other animals do things. And you'll also find where studies are available, instead of me sending you off to find studies that are freely available on the internet um, from reputable sources, then I've stuck those in as well. And most of the modules, but not all, have got a transcript. I try to make sure that it's accessible for people who have come to it with different modalities of learning so the videos in there for people who like watching there's that you can switch the video off and listen to me if you if that's how you work and if you want to do the reading then that's fine too and the studies are all there for you that relate to that module so you don't have to go hunting for them or you know go looking for them and it just drives you mad because you don't exactly remember the names that i said or whatever it was so that's basically it and yeah, so I just wanted to kind of like show you what was behind the scenes in lots of ways and give you an idea about the kind of content that's in there. Some modules are just going to be by their very nature more in depth. Other modules are just going to be by their very nature much more simple. But I didn't want to just treat it with lip surface. I really, when I started, I was incredibly frustrated because there wasn't very much literature on frustration. You can look in uh, welfare books and there'll be two pages you look in dog behavior books from academic writers two pages you look on uh, google scholar and you look for studies and there's a handful there may be three or four that are published every year that as they relate to behavior with dogs um, or behavior with other animals other than humans and that frustrated me because I had solutions. Of course, there are solutions that are great and easy solutions as long as you know precisely what it is that, that your dog is struggling with. But at the same time as that, I didn't really understand it myself. And I wanted to put together a course that was everything that I'd have wanted at the beginning of my career with dogs, especially in shelters, because shelter life is by its very nature immensely frustrating. And for me, the biggest problem in shelters is not fear, it's frustration. And so we get a lot of that uh, 
that I was just by my very nature. The things that, you know, I couldn't understand why um, this dog had bitten that dog or this dog had attacked this dog or what had happened here or why I'd got nipped or why this had happened or why certain dogs used to be real difficult to get out of kennels and all of these things that were related to frustration um, around rewards and around resources and so on because it's an entirely positive environment that was working in that kennel and kennels in themselves and shelters and the, the swap between this life and that life can be very challenging even if we think this life is amazing there can be those kind of minor niggles not just for the human but for the dog because basically you don't have the language necessarily as a dog the, the body language the ability to communicate your needs that you had in the uh, the last module and I've just finished recording a webinar for somebody else about frustration. And he used a picture of a little poodle who came to stay with me. I can't even remember his name. He's just this little dot. And he lived with an old lady because po little toy poodles, apricot toy poodles in France are an old lady dog, if you didn't know that already. And so his old lady, I think she'd gone in the nursing home or she died or something terrible had happened. And this little dog came in and he was sitting in the office when I went in and I went, okay, well, he's coming home with me. So <laughs> I couldn't bear to see this little tiny thing and I had this picture that I've used in that that module that I just recorded this afternoon and when I looked at it looking back I think that was 2016 2017 that I had that dog I know it was May but I can't remember what, else, what year um and it, he was very restless and most, most of the dogs that I've had in foster, it was 150 dogs I reckon I've had in foster uh, for a night or two nights or sometimes 18 months. He was very restless and I've only had two other dogs that were really restless when they came, really unsettled. Most kind of came and went, oh, I'm here, okay, and settled in. And that was great. But he was really fidgety and it was clear he'd had a very strict routine. And sometimes he, understanding that routine and what it was he was trying to communicate with me, like at one point he just went and he sat on the couch and he picked up his lead and I thought, oh my God, you just this must be the time you went out for your walk. And, and he, he just didn't understand what had happened and his whole world had changed. So for me, from a shelter perspective, I wish I'd had all of this. I wish somebody had tidied it up and made it all neat and just gone, here, Go through it in this systematic way. You will understand this, 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 and this, and this. And yes, I wanted all the big stuff at the end, but I also know I needed the stuff at the beginning. And I wanted the theory as well. And I wanted the theory put to me. I'm an, I I wanted it put to me in smart, you know, uh, layperson language that anybody can understand as long as they know a little bit about dogs and a little bit about stuff, um, you know, and everything is kind of explained, hopefully not in a patronising way, I try not to be. Um, I, I work a lot with teenagers, they tell you if you if you are, <laughs> they're very good at giving feedback. So I tried to just do what I would have wanted right at the beginning of my career and what I think would be valuable to you. Now, obviously, there's going to be more in there than anybody could ever wish for. Um, I guess with the webinars each week, the kind of the lives on Facebook and so on, I guess by the end of it, you can have 72, 80 hours of, of stuff if you wanted to listen to it, which probably most people don't. But it is everything. It's everything. Because I only sat back at the end of it and went, I may not know it all. I've not got a PhD in this topic, but I know enough now to know to spot it instantly to know exactly what works and how and when and to see those results so much more quickly so that really helped with me in terms of having this kind of nebulous and woolly approach to the behavior problems i was seeing um, all of which are emotional based you know i don't do very much training um apart from the training that relates to the things that will be helpful for guardians i just i, I just wanted that really the, those kind of solutions to that so i hope that's been helpful for you if you are undecided about whether the frustration masterclass is for you i think if you are working with dogs in a professional capacity whether you're working as a groomer whether you are a dog sitter whether you whatever it is that you're doing uh, right the way up to a behavior consultant because i know this is a completely unique course i never seen anything like this which is why i made it and i also in a way, it 
helped me get to the reactivity stuff that will come two years down the line. Because next up in December, I'm going to be launching a course on impulsivity in the same way as this for professionals, people working with dogs about impulsive behavior, because they're the two big rule outs for me. And then there'll be a third one in January 2025 about fear and everything related to that, building on the stuff that I'm doing at the moment about safety signals and safety learning, as well as fear as well. Because, you know, so much has changed in fear and safety in the last 20 years. I did my psychology degree. I finished in 1994. That was before it was the year before the first functional MRI. And since then, uh, Joseph Ledoux's stuff on fear came out 2000-ish and the stuff starting, you know, Pankset publishes his in 1998. We started to see all of that uh, just after I finished my degree. Helpful because there was much less stuff to learn. But everything has come on that in the last 20 years or so. And the stuff on safety is stuff that's only been there for like three years the the literature has been emerging in the last three years for that as a science and frustration is still lagging behind and maybe that's because it's a little bit more nebulous and maybe people see it as less important uh, relatively speaking in terms of my work it sometimes very important and sometimes not important at all it depends but at least now when i look at it, uh, when guardians say to me i don't know what the i've got 87 problems i've got eight literally 18 problems um, they hadn't listed it at that point, but I've got all of these things. Everything is just not working. None of it's working. Knowing how to help them with their frustration, knowing how to help the dog with their frustration. Often I see results, like like I said, two or three weeks um, because we can start to put it, things into place that make a lot of sense for the dog and also for the guardian as well. So it really revolutionised how quickly I could work and how quickly I could see um, an impact. And it's not to say that that's going to be the same for dogs who struggle with fear and anxiety as well, or just fear and anxiety. But anxiety in itself can have its frustrations. So I just wanted to kind of say, okay, here's this neat thing, uh, learn about it, then you know it, and then you'll spot it when you see it, you'll be able to deal with it really quickly, and bang, you're done. Um, so that we can build on that with the impulsivity and then the fear and then the whole reactivity course almost writes itself in a way. So yeah, it's, and it's me. So I sometimes pontificate on things that are important to me and, and I take the approach of, we don't always know. I think if I could say anything, my answer is usually it depends and we don't know enough yet. Um, and probably that's, the answer to the entire course in itself so i don't take a formulaic approach with stuff uh, and i play fast and loose with my interpretations of things sometimes but i'll tell you that i'm playing fast and loose with it and i'll tell you what we don't know um which i think I, I, i'm looking i'm struggling and sometimes in the dog training world because everything's so black and white and then i think nah it's so much more nuanced than that and that was one thing I really struggled with as well so I'll tell you where there's nuance and sometimes I use profanities that I can't help myself uh, I also work a lot as I said with teenagers and people who disengage really quickly like myself and so I try to make sure that it is fun and interesting and that you've got case studies that are really practical because I love academia and I love understanding stuff but at the same time, I don't just like understanding stuff for the understanding of the stuff. I like to have practical, a practical benefit from my work with dogs. And that was the main thing. So hopefully that's giving you everything that you will need to understand and to make the decision about whether you or not you want to join the course. If you want more, ask me. I, uh, you know, I'm here to answer your questions. It opens on, um, the course itself is open for you to book onto right now. The course goes live on the 4th of September uh, 2023, I should say that because some of you might be watching this in future years. And I am just running it on to, uh, the open, the slot is open until uh, the end of September. The reason for that is I like kind of to have a bit of momentum about who's, so that we're all almost at the same point. But also, as I said, I'm writing the impulsivity stuff right now, which will go live in January. And really, I'm going to kind of say almost you need this as a prerequisite because frustration is a subset of impulsivity. It comes under the umbrella of impulse control. 
and you really need to get your teeth in, into this one before you do the impulsivity one. So I make no apologies for not having this as a permanent year round thing because I want those discussions to, you know, happen on Facebook or whatever and to be able to concentrate on that in order to then pass over and do the next thing that's exciting to me. So I'm not going to be running it again until September 2024. Um, new course will be out in January. That's all but written in its skeletal form and the video is all there as well. Um, so I just need to kind of put that together for January. Uh, but the idea is that they will be progressive and that they will join on to each other and give you the building blocks for if you're working with dogs who are struggling with any of the big feelings, the big emotions. So we'll go through frustration, impulse control issues, fear, anxiety, safety learning, and then finally we finish with that reactivity and aggression as well. So it does all kind of like there's a big master plan right in there as well. So any questions, let me know. I hope to see those of you who've already signed up um, on September 4th. I'm looking forward to giving you my first case study. I can't remember if it's the one with the 18 or not, uh, but there's also a case study in uh, the materials where the dog had like 17 or 18, 19 problems that the guardians had listed. So it'd be another one like that and one simple solution. Okay, so let me know any questions and I hope to see you on Monday. Thank <laughs> you.